Welcome everyone to this uh, campfire gathering. So I'm very excited today because we're welcoming Damien Walter. So uh, in case anyone didn't catch the film we put out uh, last week where uh, Damien and David were discussing uh, the deeper mythos of Dune, which obviously came out quite recently. Uh, Damien's a, a sci-fi critic and a columnist, he used to write a column in The Guardian, he's also the, the host of the science fiction podcast and all around extremely knowledgeable uh, on, on all things sci-fi. And I think um, did a fantastic job of looking at Dune in particular in, in our recent film. And today what we're gonna be doing is expanding the conversation out a little bit and looking at how science fiction can really be used as a lens on culture in general and what we can learn by looking, really looking through a lens of sci-fi. So Damien, welcome back and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I'm excited and kind of kind of honored to be here because I've watched a number of the campfires when they've been uh, released on on YouTube as well. So it, it's kind of just very cool to be participating in this. Thank you for the invitation. Pleasure. So Damien, I thought we could uh, I thought we'd dive right in um, because since we put out the film around June, there's been a major science fiction related announcement from, from Facebook. So talking about um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg's plans to create a metaverse, uh, so to speak. Mm. And I thought maybe we could start by, um, by filling people in a little bit on the, the very strong influence of, in particular, Neil Stevenson's work, Snow Crash, on that mm -hmm. word uh, in general, but also on Silicon Valley and, and the kind of technology we're seeing coming out. So, so what did you make of that announcement? Yeah, it's an interesting decision to make as the, the head of one of the world's largest technology companies. Uh, a, that you want to, to rebrand the company at all. And you can say a lot about Facebook's reasons for wanting to become uh, meta. Uh, but then to decide that you're going to take uh, a word defined uh, for its relationship to a dystopian futures of uh, mass control of the public uh, and say, yeah, we, we're going to own uh, the dystopian future and uh, control of the people through virtual reality, uh, which was Neil Stevenson's uh, thinking about it. Um, so you wonder exactly what um, Mark Zuckerberg uh knows about science fiction you feel like a lot of these people are are kind of they're wandering into the territory of science fiction but in their lives they've they probably never read a neil stevenson novel i know many people in the tech industry have but i'm suspicious that mark hasn't and so they and sometimes if they have they didn't realize that especially cyberpunk neil stevenson willing gibson you know the whole idea of like having your your body replaced with cybernetic limbs and having a, a neural implant in your brain that that these were warnings about the problems of these things and not necessarily a, uh, a road track for how we want to fulfill our, our near future um, but they seem to just be for the silicon valley elite uh, uh, like a really cool idea that they're into yeah there's something um i think you've touched on something there that i've definitely noticed because so I'm a really avid reader of sci-fi, maybe read, I don't know, maybe 20 sci-fi novels a year. Um, I, you know, I'm a writer and I used to, uh, for a long time was trying to write novels and I wrote a very long <laughs> sci-fi uh, Western. Um, so, I so I'm really kind of very immersed in, in you know, I am very immersed in sci-fi. And this, this thing you raise of dystopias being interpreted as utopias is, is mm. seems to be very, very common. Um, you know, there's a uh, there's an investor in the psychedelic space called Christian Angermeyer, and one of his companies is um, around longevity and not just extending our lifespans, but ending death. That's his thing. And he had a um, he had a LinkedIn post which said, "Right, first we're going to cure mental health with uh, psilocybin. All, all all mental health issues will we'll sort, and then once everyone's happy, the next thing they want to do is live forever." And I thought, well, no, I, I actually think <laughs> I think a sign of health is 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 being able to die well. And you know, um, books like Altered Carbon um, look at okay, well, what would happen if we had kind of functional immortality? And the people who um, who've been alive the longest are are the craziest um, in in that book and that those series. So that's a really 
it might, I'd be curious to delve in a little bit more into to just utopias and dystopias in general, because it is striking how a, a, someone will write a science fiction dystopia and then someone will pick it up as um, uh, kind of without any of the negative bits. Sure, yeah. I, I think it's uh, it's one of those repeating tropes of, of dystopias that as soon as you have immortality, it will be uh, cordoned off by the rich. Uh, William Gibson does the same. He has uh, a, a family of, uh, I think they're uh, Austrian, Australian kind of corporate aristocracy and they clone themselves through time uh, but these warnings don't don't seem to get through to people and life extension and immortality are another like obsession I think of the Silicon Valley uh, elite maybe it's an issue with um, with George Orwell you know much as I greatly respect George Orwell's contribution to uh, how we think about politics and particularly the ideas of dystopia uh, that 1984 is this you know boot in the face of a dystopia um it, it's completely oppressive it's uh you know that this society everyone in the society knows that it isn't working um you know it's a it's a bad place even if you buy into the new speak you know there's going to be enough there to tell you that this isn't uh the ideal for your humanity and i think that makes many of us think when we we pick up 1984 as our model of dystopia uh that well we're not that bad yeah as far as we know you know <laughs> we, we look at the world on mass we think that it seems to be going better uh than oceania uh but then really actually the really significant dystopia of the 20th century uh is aldous huxley and Brave New World, you know, and that's written, I think it's like 10, 15 years before uh, 1984. And Huxley's vision was uh, of, inspired by visiting America. And Brave New World, as much as anything, is like a parody of the American society that he saw, because you already had, uh, you know, kind of the beginnings of, in fact, psychedelic use there, which kind of inspired Soma uh, in there. And uh, it was, it's a land of beautiful people who are having a beautiful time and who value freedom as their highest good, but who are actually very, very carefully controlled behind the scenes of that through media control uh, and through all of the layers of control that we kind of fear we're being more exposed to now. So this question of utopia and dystopia, I think, is actually more relevant uh, than ever. And the smart question is exactly what is it that we are uh, potentially scared of for our future? There isn't just that dystopian vision of, of Orwell, I think. Yeah, it's, a, it's a interesting to bring um, to bring Huxley into it. And, and this um, maybe this I need someone Gabby has just mentioned in the chat around um, his, his other book, Island, kind of um, uh, which took another view on. Um, I don't know if it's uh, Gabby suggests perhaps a counter to Brave New World. Um, mm. But certainly this, uh, there is a dichotomy in um, science fiction, I think, with um, drugs in particular. So drugs can be used to expand our consciousness and, and connect us to different dimensions. And, and you know, thinking of famously uh, taking the red pill, right? It's, it's, it's an mm -hmm. ingestion. It's a moment of ingestion, that, which is a very Gnostic kind of idea, I think. So, um, and at the same time, we can plug ourselves into something like the Matrix and take, you know, take the blue pill and just completely forget about everything. And I, I wonder, um, I wonder about the metaverse and this sense of um, all-encompassing virtual reality that we can sort of. Play. As I was watching Zuckerberg's <laughs> thing, and he was describing, yeah, well, you can do this. You can, it's you know, you can work in an office. And there's people walking around. I was like, yeah, but you could just work in an office. <laughs> you can just go and see your mates. Like that's just you're describing a kind of a mimicry of life. Um, so yeah, I wonder, um, I wonder what your thoughts are about this, specifically drugs in science fiction. You know, you talked about in the June film, the, um, mm. the, this kind of psychedelic, I mean, it is, there's a drug at the heart of it, right? Uh, but it's a, it's a perhaps not, um, fully explored area of sci-fi, but, um, but, but very, very prevalent. Yeah, it's, 
the drugs in uh, science fiction tends to be uh, on this spectrum. They're either like Soma in Aldous Huxley, they are the means of control and pacifying the population. Uh, or you can take it through to Melange, you know, the spice in June. And this is like the liberative uh, chemical, uh, the psychedelic drug that lets people live much longer lives. You know, so that's something we're trying to do at the moment. Let's the navigators move through space time. Uh, I'm not sure if we quite have plans for that with psychedelics yet, but uh, you know, I'm I'm sure that's probably coming at some point. Uh, and let's you know, someone like Paul Atreides, you know, like scion of a rich household, like expand his mind into uh, beyond just like the power structures and the politics of his area. Uh, and it's a bit related to the utopia dystopia discussion as well, because we're asking about these technologies, you know, and psychedelics are a technology that we can file alongside many others from science fiction, like artificial intelligences and uh, robots that might serve us or androids that might even appear to be human, you know, are these good or bad things? And that's kind of the central question of the values that we uh, apply to these um, technologies generally. Uh, and with drugs, we find ourselves like in this, uh, in this loop. So people who are more kind of conservatively minded are, are very kind of committed against uh, the psychedelic revolution, for instance, precisely for the reason that many people are very interested in it because it liberates you from these social structures that we don't all want to be uh, stuck within. So I think like psychedelics particularly perform this, this value role. What are your values that the psychedelics can allow you to achieve or to uh, to lose sight of for the the more conservative thinker, and that's a good you know that's a big fault line through science fiction: the conservative versus the liberal, and our other political ideologies there as well. Yeah, it's really um, it's very poignant for me right now uh, because I'm <clears throat> a participant in a study uh, DMT continuous infusion study at Imperial College. So that's um, DMT pumped into your veins for 30 minutes instead of the, the, the regular intense wow. 10 minute experience. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty full on. And, um, I had my first dosing, uh, a couple of days ago, which I can't talk about in great detail because the study is still I'm ongoing. I'm impressed that you're here with us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even sure I am actually, but yeah, um, it really struck me. What, what I can say about it is that something I was really struck by a, because the nurse who was putting in my cannulas, which puts the basically the tube of DMT going in and the, they take blood on the other arm, uh, he was talking about June, his massive fan. And we were talking about the June film as he was doing it. So it was, and it really did strike me of as, well, this is about a bit like taking spice to, in order to facilitate interdimensional travel. <laughs> but what was very striking about my experience is that it was, uh, as many psychedelic experiences are, deeply personal, deeply biographical. Um, and it made me start thinking, you know, there is this theme as well, I think, in sci-fi. And I wonder with, with we've, we've seen it with our technology already, is that we have these utopian technologies that, that could open the world and connect us, like the internet was, that eventually when you add humans into it, we fuck it all up by being human. So you have this kind of everyone's connected, and then we have this, this deep polarization on social media, et cetera. Um, so it might, might be interesting to talk about, um, about that when we have these... Um, this combination of technology and then the dark side of being human and, and that like how we've explored, how sci-fi writers have explored that because that seems to be a really key uh, a watch out for the times we live in. Mm. Well, I think science fiction kind of as our, which is my way of thinking about science fiction as our modern mythology, mythology for the age of science. One of the things that myths do is try and address the eternal questions of humanity and society. And one of the, the great eternal questions is what is a human being? You know, and we go through uh, uh, cycles of questioning about this. Uh, so we spent, you know, 
however long it was, thousands of years, uh, believing that human beings were basically uh, divine creations. There was a creator who had made us. And however pitiful our lives were, we were, uh, you know, uh, associated in some way to that creator. And we were going to go back to that creator in some way. And there's this great level of meaning to that story, whether we believe it now or not. It's hard to deny that it gave people just a great sense of meaning in their lives. And now what do we find instead? Well, we've gone through this massive cultural change. Most people probably involved in this conversation or you know, in the UK today, have a very different sense of what a human being is that that science has shown us that we're like kind of fleshy, pulpy machines. We're like biological automata in a way. Uh, and it's it's very difficult to understand the meaning of that. And that's something that science fiction has struggled with from the very beginning. So if you look at what's often credited as the first science fiction novel, Frankenstein, uh, a modern Prometheus by Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. And like Shelley, she was this amazing young woman. She wrote this novel when she was 19, basically, and it survived like 200 years since. And we know it because it's you know, Frankenstein, the monster, you know, the big head and the bolts and stuff. But that wasn't really what what Mary Shelley was writing about. What she was writing about was what she had learned from many kind of scientific thinkers of the day. She was involved with all the intellectuals of her time. Uh, and it was the, this emerging idea that like humans were like machines. So if mach we're machines, you could take a bunch of parts of a human and stitch them together and wake them up with electricity. Uh, and what would that mean? Because that's basically what every human is in our model now. So what are you? You're just kind of thrown into the world and the monster in Frankenstein goes on this kind of existential journey to figure out what they are. And I think science fiction, you know, all the way through to things like Blade Runner or then Westworld and so on, is still asking this question, basically what it is to be human. Because the answers it gives us aren't, aren't quite sufficient we don't we can't get enough meaning from this idea of being a kind of flesh robot uh so i think now uh other forms of storytelling are looking for kind of new answers to that as well yeah it's a really uh nice point uh, makes me think of um something that's always struck me you know about the popularity of star wars is i think without the force and without the mysticism it wouldn't it probably never would have been particularly mm. successful even the first movie in the cinemas, right? Um, and there's so much, that, so much of the most successful science fiction is deeply mystical. Dune, uh, The Matrix, um, obviously Star Wars. And there, I find that a really interesting mix because, you know, you described it as kind of like it's the, it's kind of the mythos of science. And it also seems that it, it keeps coming back to spirituality over and over again. Um, with the exception, perhaps, of Star Trek. Um, but then in, in Deep Space Nine, actually, it gets really mystical. And one of the captains is a um, kind of a prophet of, of you know, uh, a species that lives in a wormhole. But there's this kind of real mystical, e even there, you get some, some mysticism through. But so why do you think that is? And, and um, yeah, what, why this mystical thread? And is it getting stronger, mm. perhaps? It is getting stronger as well. Uh, I sometimes... Like science fiction fandom is divided, I'd say about 70, 30, with the 30 being people who are kind of what you might say, like psychedelically switched on or kind of on some level mystical thinkers. And the 70% being people who are, um, you know, they are quite hard scientific thinkers and what they like are the engines and the machines and the thinking through how we're going to go into to space. Uh, and build like orbital platforms. And that's their vision of what science fiction is. And it is the antipathy of the mystical and the mythical, and they don't like those things. So if I want to tease those people a little, you can kind of like go through a list of all of the, the mystical imagery in our science fiction, like, uh, you know, 
the matrix i don't think you have to argue too hard for the matrix so you, there's clearly like a messiah story there but neo in the second movie particularly is literally for the whole movie dressed like a catholic seminarian you know <laughs> and he's he's basically fighting the devil <laughs> Uh, so, you know, you have this lots and lots of like Catholic revivalism in, uh, in science fiction uh, through Joseph Campbell, who's a very committed Catholic. He actually left the Catholic Church because it stopped being Catholic enough for him. Uh, and <laughs> a lot of the, the hero's journey of Campbell is taken, of course, from like Bible stories. So it's all there, you know, there's just a massive amount of mysticism. Our behavior around science fiction, uh, you know, going into a darkened temple, essentially, to watch a kind of glowing altar giving us our, our sermon for the week, um, dressing up in the characters. You know, this is something I chatted about with John Viveki in our interview, uh, actually, you know, wanting to embody these people and then going to huge conventions like San Diego Comic-Con, I think the last one was like 250,000 people. So, you know, this is all of our religious need. Why is it in there? I mean, I guess the evolutionary argument would be we have some deep kind of evolutionary need for these mystical stories, they're playing some role. I, I tend to think, and my ideas around this are still forming, that um, there's basically a lot of truth in our spiritual myths. They talk about reality on a level that science fundamentally isn't showing us. Science is showing us a very accurate picture of a very tiny part of the universe, and myths give us a much more kind of nebulous picture, but the bigger picture of like the creation that we're actually living in. So when we, when we look out into space in our science fiction myths like Star Wars, we just end up creating the myths because they're, they're very deeply truthful and telling us things we really need to know. Just before we go to the Q&A, one thing just came to me, which might bring us in a nice little circle from, from the first question. Um, how if we're if we're looking at the emergence of let's say a metaverse type a, yeah a metaverse like facebook's version where we're sort of half uh or more of our more than half of our time is spent in a kind of a virtual world say and and it's augmented across the the normal day-to-day -day op operating we have and where we're just kind of um, jumping in and out of the matrix constantly which we kind of are with our phones anyway but if we take it to that next level how do you feel about that? Does it give you a, do you get excited about it or do you think, oh, oh shit, that's gonna, that's not gonna end well? Yeah, so from a, for a science fiction person, I'm a skeptic of many of the visions of science fiction and their uh, manifestation into reality. Uh, the thing I'm like primarily skeptical about is artificial intelligence. Uh, that's slightly a side point from the question that you're asking. And I'm skeptical about the metaverse. Will and Gibson put it this way that, and Will and Gibson kind of, he didn't coin the term cyberspace, but he popularized it. Uh, it was being used in kind of some elite design circles and Will and Gibson, as he, as he does, he kind of picked it up, put it in his cyberpunk stories and cyberspace was born. And the metaverse is kind of, cyberspace again with a new word for it uh but gibson kind of corrected himself uh, i think he did this like seven or eight years ago now and he said you know i really thought that cyberspace would be another place but it turns out it's just the same place that we were we were already in um actually the the sci-fi writer charlie strauss makes a good point about this as well that human human beings normalize technology almost instantly so as soon as we can fly across the atlantic in a jet plane we just take it for granted we don't think about it again maybe for two weeks it's surprising to us and then it's just there and we will probably do this with uh with the metaverse in fact we absolutely will do that and i think my question is whether we really want these these alternate spaces at the moment i think the metaverse was really um it developed out from video gaming but video gaming seems to be something that
people do a, a, like a specific point and it fulfills a specific purpose, maybe kind of like adolescent bonding happens very well in the metaverse. But I actually see that most people don't want this fully immersive experience because it's kind of extraneous information. Like I don't want to have to look at an avatar of everybody. I'd much rather just hear their voices. Actually, I think that's why Clubhouse was successful to the extent that it was. Um, so I'm, I'm skeptical that we will be sucked into uh, a kind of artificial worlds any more than we have been to our already existing uh, digital realities, which of course is to quite a large extent, but we are at least starting to, to recognize that this is happening. And in fact, we do it very quickly. Like really we started to see what social media algorithms were doing to us really just in the space of a few years. And you can already see people's behavior uh, changing for them. So I, I hope we're not heading into the worst dystopias and that we don't all end up living in Mark Zuckerberg's 3D fantasy world. Because uh, I just don't think it would be very interesting. I think Mark's too boring to be the person who creates our reality. Yeah. Yeah, let's hope, let's hope not. I just had that flash of that uh, Black Mirror episode where the guy traps his uh, co-workers in, in that game, um, the famous episode. I can't quite remember it, but uh, what a horrific thought to be in Mark Zuckerberg's uh, little cage uh, forever. So yeah, no, I, I tend to agree. I think the, um, I think what often happens in Silicon Valley in particular is this kind of, this disconnect from the, the kind of deeper human essence that's always with us when, when we're interacting with any technology and this kind of forgetfulness or, or per perhaps just kind of blindness to the messy human qualities that we're bringing and the kind of the deep archetypal uh, meaning beneath everything. So like, you know, the metaverse film, these colorful kind of like incredibly cringy, hi, Mark, what are you doing? And there's this kind of false interactions. Um, it, it doesn't feel, uh, it feels so performative that I don't think it, it, it could ever be something we were really experiencing. But um, uh, yeah, it is, it's a wild time uh, to, be, to be looking at the world through the lens of sci-fi. Um, I wanted to open up to, to some Q&A because I know we have um, a lot of smart people in the room. Um, and uh, so I'm just looking through the chat. Uh, noticing people trolling me, suggesting that none of this is real and I'm still tripping. So thank you guys for that. That's uh, very, <laughs> very kind of you. Um, if you have a question, perhaps put it in the chat. Um, I know Gabby, you, you were mentioning a few different things and I wondered if you wanted to, to start us off. Sure. Hi, Damien. Hello. Uh, so, my idea is like because I, I was listening to your conversation um, before like the the previous video uh one part that I, I didn't see you mentioning over much or, or at least i would like to see you kind of like extrapolate a little bit more is that um for what i understand dune was kind of like first a, a response to uh asimov's foundation um you know just kind of like being a little bit more skeptical when he brings up the butlerian jihad uh, instead of just making AI this amazing thing that is going to save us all. Uh, and the other thing, too, is just the idea that we as a species, we have a tendency to outsource our thinking and our decision making either to machines or to charismatic leaders. From what I understand, the idea of Dune, aside from the hero's arc, which is very interesting, is all it, it is kind of dystopian if you keep reading the rest of the novels, because I don't know, I remember like it took me a while to get back to the other books once I had that realization because I was totally on the, oh, the, he's such a hero train. So I don't know, I kind of wanted to see you elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah, June is a, a terrible universe uh, because it's, it's trapped in uh, the medieval stage of, of human social evolution. And that was... It was Herbert's starting point because he was asked, I think it was John W. Campbell who asked him and said, I, I, I want a fantasy story set in space. Uh, and this is to uh, 
compete with, uh, you know, or to reach the same audience as Asimov's foundation, because foundation is kind of the foundational science fiction story uh, for the American science fiction community written in the 1950s. Uh, and foundation is all about the evolution of human society and culture. Uh, so it's, it's inspired partly by Asimov picking up uh, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, so what you have in Foundation is the fall of an empire uh, and then a small group essentially of scientists who, who go out and form the first foundation. There's a second foundation as well. And what they do to control the universe is they create a religion so we're kind of back to catholicism again the, mm -hmm. the religion that the roman empire used to continue kind of being an empire uh so it's this in in asimov you have then like the evolution of human society uh but in june you have the stagnation of human society um and the the continual fascination because in in asimov individuals become less and less important. In fact, they're not really important. Psychohistory is important. The, the tides of history are going to define everything. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, it rather affects the drama of a uh, of foundation that it's all going to be determined through uh, kind of behavioral economics on some level. Uh, mm -hmm. But in so in June, you're able to tell this uh, this much more human story of wars and great houses and all of the things that humanity did through the medieval period that fascinates people in fantasy like game of thrones now another mm -hmm. thing inspired by june um but then herbert wanted to undermine that so he makes the the savior figure is also uh, a charismatic leader like paul atreides knows that he knows he's going to take millions or billions of people to their doom on his path, but he can't separate himself from it. So the commentary, as you say, is definitely there in June as well. Yeah, because uh, I think Herbert himself so said something that like charismatic leaders should come with a label, maybe harmful to your health or something <laughs> like that. And, sure. Yeah, and, and the, the idea of Paul is just like he starts as like a space Jesus, but he goes from space Jesus to space Hitler very mm -hmm. quickly. So, and I, I think that that is the part that makes the, the series so compelling to me. Uh, it's just because it, there's that caveat that, that maybe, uh, I don't know. I think that a lot of uh, his writing goes back. I wonder if he was a little bit of a libertarian, you know, if like he places a lot of personal responsibility. Uh, like I think that some, at least how interpreted is that way. Yeah, I think he certainly was. In fact, I'm reading the the last two books of the series at the moment, which I haven't read since I was a teenager. Uh, the, uh, Herbert's original series and there's quite a lot of attacks on liberals in there actually yeah. and the science fiction community conservatives between... too aristocrats <laughs> specifically <laughs> yeah. um okay. so uh it was um sorry I forgot my point there. there's something I wanted to come back on what you were saying yeah. and it slipped out of my head whilst we were whilst we were joking around there maybe it'll come back to me Fair enough. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Gabby. And uh, yeah, if it comes back, Damien, uh, all good. We'll go to the next question. And also, Gabby, thank you for saying both Space Jesus and Space Hitler in one sentence, because uh, that <laughs> brilliant imagery popping up in my head right now. Um, so, uh, Guy, you have not one, but several or two, at least, uh, interesting questions. I understand you can't, yes, you can't speak because your mic has a problem. So I'm going to read your uh, guys' questions out. Um, so I'm actually going to go to the first one, I think, which is um, related to 20th century myth. Can you recommend a utopian sci-fi movie, uh, or I'm going to say novel perhaps as well, as opposed to the usual dystopian fare? So may maybe another way would be, Damien, um, yeah, what, what are your preferred utopian um, sci-fi stories mm. that we might check out sure 
Uh, I remembered what I was going to say back to Gabby there as well. So I'll start with that, which is that just that June is, is really good myth making. Because if you look at the myths of the, the young hero in kind of, we have some really good Navajo myths on this, like the listener, um, they're, they're also warnings against what it is to be a hero. But we've kind of lost that in our stories like, um, you know, Star Wars, for instance, you know, we just tell one side of that hero's story. So that's why June is is better. And I think um, utopias. Uh, yeah, I interviewed Neil Stevenson. God, that was some years ago now. And he made the point in in the interview, because I put this question to him, why are we so negative? about the future uh, and his answer was that it's all about Hollywood special effects budgets because uh, visualizing a utopian future is extremely expensive. I think Steven Spielberg did it in um, the Tom Cruise movie that he made. I've forgotten the name of that and it wasn't also a particularly memorable film whereas dystopias you just kind of dirty up some pictures of uh, you know the Empire State Building or, or uh, bury the Statue of Liberty in a beach somewhere. Uh, it's much easier to depict the, the fall of society and it's much more dramatic as well. So, you know, the easy dramas come out of that and dystopian stories are very popular, Hunger Games, um, also actually a very good piece of storytelling as well, the Hunger Games. But certainly my favorite utopia, um, and we mentioned this chatting with David, uh, the culture novels by Ian M. Banks, uh, because the culture is, I think, for everyone liberally minded, is the future that liberals want to live in. You know, we have some super powerful and completely trustworthy and benign uh, computer overlords, uh, the mines in Ian, Ian M. Banks, and they just sort everything out for us. And we just get to uh, play uh and live live for centuries and do whatever we want but also be a bit bored so what do the the culture do i mean i'm not sure what what ian banks would have made of like woke culture today and social justice warriors but the culture are like the ultimate social justice warriors because they find uh backwards societies like huge imperiums occupying like 80 planets or something and they go and subvert them and remake them as better societies just for fun because there's not much else to do if you're that powerful uh but i always there was always a suggestion in banks's novels as well that there was also quite a lot of manipulation going on behind the scenes and potentially the very nice minds weren't quite as nice when you actually got down to the the, the the nuts and bolts of the situation. I think that's always the issue with any utopia. Like it's somebody's utopia, but it's probably somebody else's dystopia as well. Yeah, I'm really glad you you brought up uh, the culture novels. I was um, lucky enough to have somewhat of a connection with Ian uh, Banks because he spoke at my university and I got to introduce him and then occasionally exchanged emails like when I felt brave enough to drop, mm -hmm. drop in one um, and really you know yeah I think it's a great example of a, a utopia and the ability as well for people to switch genders at will is something I always yes. think about in the, in the current mm -hmm. discussions that, that we see around gender because um, there is yeah it is a sort of peak postmodern fantasy in a way but and then at, there is a deep a lot of darkness as well in, in mm -hmm. the, the kind of uh, culture novels but this, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, I think. And Amazon were going to make um, uh, one of the, the, the first culture novels into a show, which seems to have now not happened. It's, it's kind of, um, I think, quite difficult. Maybe to uh, proving your point, Damien, about making utopias uh, seems to have been perhaps too difficult to do. Sure. Uh, yeah. So um, let's see who else we have. I think, Magnus, you had a question. Uh, hi, Damien. Um, Hello. Yeah, just I'm pretty sure Jules Verne, uh, I think he was a member of the, of, um, the Masonic community in Paris, in Paris yeah, and the Rosicrucians. And um, like I've heard people argue that he brought some of that kind of esoteric teaching and sort of encoded it in secret in uh, Captain Nemo and other books. And I wonder if that was just like of oh, its time or there's this more of a like a, you know, 
actually this is quite common. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, many of the, the British uh, science fiction and especially the fantasy writers uh, of like the Victorian era were involved with uh, the Order of the Golden Dawn uh, and kind of other, the Rosicrucians as well, and the Masons, uh, who's the one I'm trying to think of, the author of Dracula, uh, and many of the ideas in Dracula as well are kind of um, hermetic in their origins. And if you think about what we're doing with science fiction, um, it kind of meets a lot of the hermetic principles. I mean, Firstly, a lot of our early, very early kind of the roots of science, uh, like Giordano Bruno. So he is an early physicist, essentially, and was an alchemist as well. And, uh, you know, of course, the word alchemy comes from uh, the word chemistry is derived from from alchemy. But the idea is it wasn't simply that. Um, they got kind of ideas about chemistry from there. There were, there were very fundamental ideas for science kind of encoded into hermeticism. So the, the basic one that, that Bruno was drawing on was the idea that you could have a model of something in reality that wasn't the thing itself. Like you could therefore have a molecular structure that told you about the movement of water for instance, because you could have a model of it. And it's kind of shocking that we, we, you really had to think back to what the psychology before that would have been, before we actually realized that you could model things in this way, which is what we're doing with science. And what we're also doing with, with science fiction as well, because we typically, I think of science fiction writers, good ones like Frank Herbert or Ian M. Banks as systems thinkers. So they're people who can, in the case of, of Ian Banks, you know, think, well, what would a utopian society actually do? How will it interact with other levels of civilization? He can play out in his thinking kind of the clashes of different scales of civilization. Uh, and that's very important for us to be able to do because we're kind of doing that real time on planet Earth at the moment, clashing like conservative with liberal societies and trying to figure out uh, what's happening. So I think it's just a natural overlap that someone who is like a systems thinker and is a science fiction writer would probably be very fascinated with hermetic traditions as well and learn learn lessons from them. I don't know specifically about uh, Jules Verne and Captain Nemo, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me if that was true. Thank you. Um, so uh, please, if I missed your question in the chat, please put it uh, back in because it's uh, the chat's a little bit busy um and or physically raise your hand and while we're waiting for that um <clears throat> damien I just, something just struck me about um we haven't talked yet about genre right in general and what gets to be called science fiction and what doesn't and the bridges between say sci-fi and fantasy you've touched on it a little bit but for example um there's this phrase speculative fiction that gets used mm -hmm. to kind of euphemistically for people who write um say like kazuo ishiguru who writes, you know, science fiction, but he's he's too he has too <laughs> too much literary prowess, and so it'll often be referred to as <laughs> speculative fiction. What what do you make of that? Like, I guess we're talking now about the attitude that we have towards sci-fi and and how good an art form it is. Mm. I think everyone will be rushing to be a science fiction writer again in about five years time i'll put that out there as a prediction people will have science fiction like tattooed on their their book covers uh because for probably for at least a decade it, it has been a term that people have avoided you don't see it used actually even in the marketing of a film like june uh, which is clearly science fiction but you would if you go and look at the marketing campaigns for that that's not a term that they're using for it generally might be categorized on that on netflix maybe um and yeah, you have all of these, these terms. Maybe the key one really is science fiction and fantasy. So you have loads of derivations of science fiction, sci-fi, speculative fiction, skiffy, 
which is sci-fi pronounced literally, you know, and they all have various different allegiances. Speculative fiction is more the literary end. Science fiction often uses SF. Um, but this science fiction never escapes from fantasy, which is very annoying for kind of that 70% of science fiction fans who are there for the science. And they object to the fact that it's always linked with fantasy. But we're kind of, we're doing this for a reason, you know, because really science fiction is a kind of fantasy for people who like that kind of fantasy. You know, it's a subset of what we do with fantasy, which is try and envision the world in the way that we want it and the values that we want to experience and the lives that we want to live out. Uh, and science fiction is like, in general, a set of values, like uh, the competent engineer who was very often the hero of Arthur C. Clarke stories, for instance, the guy who can build the space elevator. And that's, that's a really powerful fantasy to live out for the kind of person who wants to do that. So science fiction in a way is, is performing that, that role for people as well. Uh, I tend to object to the idea of science fiction as a genre. Um, it's given birth to many genres like space opera or cyberpunk, steampunk, uh, alternate histories. There's probably like 30 genres that science fiction has given birth to. But in itself, it's very difficult to identify what, what is generic about science fiction, what three things are shared across all science fiction stories. And you can't really identify anything. So I think what we're really looking at with science fiction is it's a literary tradition of it in its own right. It's like an alternate way of approaching uh, storytelling uh, where in literary fiction, for instance, we, we assume we know what reality is. We assume we know the, the systems that things are happening within uh, and that saves a lot of time and it allows us to focus maybe more on the details of mundane human behavior, which is a great thing to do in its own way. Over in science fiction world, though, what we want to do is question all of our basic assumptions about reality. And we, it's not that science fiction can't depict the mundane. There was a movement of mundane science fiction that did focus on doing that, but it's just not what we turn to science fiction for. As with a novel like Dune, you know, we want to follow a human being beyond the boundaries of human experience. We want to follow them into a transcendent state so we can at least partially experience that ourselves and that's what science fiction is there for us um, and that for me just doesn't fit within the bounds of a being a genre particularly so I have these arguments endlessly on my uh, my science fiction group on Facebook currently or or other forums uh, where, where I've done a lot of my learning about science fiction arguing with the old fans <laughs> uh, it, it made me just wonder um listening to you there, Damien, whether <clears throat> that, that new sort of meta myth, new kind of myth, the, the myth of the 21st century, um, how you might know it when you see it, right? Because if I'm thinking about genre in particular and like what makes science fiction, what doesn't, there is some, like, if you read a lot of sci-fi, as you, you start getting the grammar of that particular way of storytelling and you think, okay, there's a world building bit and this is world building and this is not naturally happening and I'm along with it in a way I wouldn't need to be in a different form and there's lots of tropes that I can kind of kind of uh you know get a bit of an anchor on um and I wonder about you know things that burst the genre being potentially part of that that new mythos because it's it's something unexpected right it's something mm -hmm. that is, you've never seen happen before like in you know I'm a gamer and been playing games for my whole life and I just know when I play a game I, you know, I know if there's, if there's a door, whether or not you can go in or out of that door, just because of the type of game it is and, and the rules of the world I'm in. Um, I wonder about that, whether there's a, you know, whether you might pick up in your, in your quest, whether you might find something that just blows your mind. And that's the thing that that's the, the thread to the, the new myth. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I have had this, this experience this year. Um, 
in finding something that actually did have that uh, effect on me. Uh, one of the things in in science fiction writing, coming back to Frank Herbert and June again, is this idea of just by having one new word on a page, you can create a whole kind of complex of concepts for the for the for the reader. So Frank Herbert famously does this with the ornithopter. So he never stops to tell you what an ornithopter is. He just says they get an ornithopter and you have to play around with this idea. I mean, I'm not sure exactly how much detail Herbert does give later, um, but you can just have like this contraction of, of words. And this is something that literary science fiction can do that like no other medium can. Uh, uh, actually, I think Frank Herbert uh, kind of jumps the shark with this in the later books uh, when he introduces chair dogs. Uh, <laughs> uh, and he doesn't give you any explanation of what a chair dog is, but it's very fun to think about. Uh, and then, but he, he does use it a bit too much in the book and it becomes a little bit absurd, at least for my taste. But you're absolutely right. A science fiction reader kind of trains themselves that you hit the word chair dogs and you're like, I'm just going to run with it. Uh, whereas a lot of people are like, I'm just going to stop reading at this point. That's that's thrown me out. Um, so that's going to be stuck in my head now. That image of the, the, the ever shifting image of the chair dog is now stuck mm -hmm. in my head. Um, so, uh, Patricia, you you have a question. Um, would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, thanks. Um, my question is, do you feel that science fiction works of a particular era have particular questions that they're trying to explore or answer and if you feel that that's true what are the questions for the 20th century works what were we seeking to answer in those works and what are the questions in the 21st century works that you're on the hunt for what do you think the questions are going to be that the 21st works are going to be seeking to explore. Hmm. The 20th century kind of turned on space rockets and explosions, basically, and how far space rockets and explosions could take us. Uh, so we had, we spent the first half of the century kind of uh, thinking a lot about rockets and blowing stuff up uh, and that they could take us into space. Uh, so we wanted to take that that journey, and it was it was a very optimistic vision that we could kind of take the rockets into space and explore other planets, or replace the rockets with warp engines, or whatever it was. And then I think we basically we did the space race, and uh, that was the pinnacle of that. And then we just realized that we weren't close enough to anywhere to really get there and experience the kind of fantasy of space travel that we had. So then science fiction starts asking the question of what do we do if we're just stuck on this planet together? And this planet is clearly very finite. Uh, and so we start asking questions about things like climate change. And we start asking a lot of questions about society. Like this is the point where science fiction starts thinking a lot about utopia and dystopia, because we realize that if we're not leaving, then we're probably going to end up living in one or the other. And how do we get to a good version of that? And I think those are the 20th century questions, which towards the end of that century became the question of uh, escape in other directions. So that could be psychedelics, the psychedelic experience, or like the expansion of consciousness, which June explores or 2001 explores. Um, but where it really went was to virtual worlds, video games. What, what is it like to be the kids in Tron who are sucked into the video game? And then, or to have a video game that everyone in your society is playing, like Ready Player One. So I suspect the the questions for the 20th, 21st century, to bring it back to the metaverse as well, are about how do we live in these virtual worlds and how do we balance them with the real world? And uh, to what extent is it good to be in a virtual world? And we might be surprised 
that uh, we start seeing stories which are really advocating for like complete disembodiment. It's already there as a trend in like transhumanism, but I think it will become uh, like a popular, a dominant idea in the culture. I'm not quite sure how it will manifest. And there will just be some uh, kind of old traditional thinkers who are saying, no, we want to be in our bodies and uh, in real reality instead. So I think it might be this conflict between the virtual and the real that we're looking at for the next uh, few decades at least. Uh, I want to give a little space for, for one last question. We've got time for about one more. So maybe you just want to raise your hand physically or put it in the chat if you have one. Fine if you don't as well. We've gone through quite a few. Um, see, I think I think we're good. So Damien, just, just to close, um, be nice to just just hear about you know anything that we we didn't cover that that's been of interest to you or kind of exciting you in 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 the realm of uh, everything we've been talking about in sci-fi and how sci-fi applies to um, to kind of deep culture. Um, yeah, is there anything that that we haven't quite touched on yet? Uh, I yeah, I mean one of the things that's been fascinating me because uh, discovering Clubhouse for weird reasons re sparked my interest in uh, integral theory and developmental theories which i know are an interest uh of the channel uh and i encountered them like first 15 years ago or so i think reading um one of ken wilber's small books uh and then uh i found you know kind of rediscovered the community around that through some chats on clubhouse and talking them over with people and i've since been seeing like the developmental stages all over the map in uh in science fiction so uh, i think Asimov's foundation. One of the reasons I'm disappointed with the television show is that I think Asimov had kind of from first principles figured out the kind of spiral dynamic stages for, for himself and illustrated them as various kind of uh, players and powers within the universe of foundation. There's some rumors that um, Gene Roddenberry was thinking in the same direction in the creation of the Star Trek universe as well. Uh, so now I'm kind of thinking about this in various directions of where these ideas of uh, developmental theory might um, spark some new kinds of 21st century uh, science fiction myth making, because this seems like one of the, the great ideas of the the 21st century i think the integral community are talking a lot about when when will this enter into the mainstream consciousness and how will it do so and i think it might be through a science fiction story at some point so i'm looking out for those for those stages and that discussion happening in that space brilliant exciting very exciting integral sci-fi um that, that that really intrigues me so yeah, Damien, thank you so much. This has been uh, a real pleasure. I've enjoyed it immensely. Great, thank you for the invitation, it's an honor. So in uh, typical campfire and rebelism format, just invite everyone to unmute and say a thanks to Damien for joining us and a goodbye. Thank you, Damien. Thank you, Damien. Thanks, Damien. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Bye, everyone. It was great. Bye, thank you. It was great. Thanks, great. Damien. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. If you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes. And you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.